All right, good morning, everybody. We find ourselves in another Saturday morning session. And this time we're planning to read from Exodus chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. So since that is our goal and our mission, let's get to it. John Wycliffe Version For so hath the Lord said to Moses, Enter thou to Pharaoh, and speak thou to him. The Lord God of Hebrews saith these things, Deliver thou my people, that it make sacrifice to me. That if thou, shalt, if thou forsakest it, and withholdest him, them, lo, mine hand shall be on thy fields, on horses and asses and camels and oxen and sheep, a pestilence full grievous. And the Lord shall make a marvelous thing betwixt the possessions of Israel and the possessions of Egyptians, that outerly no thing perish of these things that pertain to the sons of Israel. And the Lord ordained a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this word in the land. Therefore the Lord made this world in the other day, into other day, and all the living beasts of Egyptians were dead, for so hath outerly no thing perished of the beast of the sons of Israel. And Pharaoh sent to say, Neither anything was dead of these things which Israel welded, and the heart of Pharaoh was made grievous, and he delivered not the people. Now King James. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and wilt hold them still, behold, the land of the Lord is upon my cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous moraine, and the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall be nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on, on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel... Uh, sorry, I must scroll over. Died not one... And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So ends the reading. Now, I thought I'd keep uh, on track with a couple other things I've been doing in these videos. One is listening to Ron Wyatt and the stories of his discoveries. And the other is reading about... Um, some of the Christian Reformationists over time. At this point, I've been reading about John Calvin. So, uh, I've also loaded up uh, Michael Rood talking about Ron Wyatt and the Red Sea Crossing. So, let's listen to a little of that, a little from Ron Wyatt and Zedekiah's Cave, and read a little bit about Calvin, and then we'll wrap it up and read some more from Chapter 9 in Exodus next time. Because it says that God led us not through the land of the Philistines, but God led the people about through the way of the Red Sea wilderness. How did he do that exactly? It says, instead of going up around the northern end, which was controlled by the Philistines to get into the land of Midian, where Mount Sinai is, instead, he said, turn and encamp before Pi-Hahiro between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. You shall encamp by the sea. And we turned from that place, from Etham, and we entered into the Wadi Watir, and now we are going to travel down to pi -Hakirot. In Egyptian, it is pi -Hakirot, which means between the gorges. And you'll see that in just a few moments. Just north of there is Migdal, which in Hebrew means tower. It is an Egyptian military encampment on the Yamsuf. 
right across eight miles of water is Baal Zephon, over against Baal Zephon. This is the very place in which it took place. The archeological remains of these things can still be seen to this very day. And it says, ye shall encamp by the sea, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. Cool, now that's Exodus chapter 14. We're reading from Exodus chapter nine, so it's all uh, tying together nicely. And this physical evidence really is a convincing way to uh, monitor or confirm the veracity of the stories in the Bible. And that is uh, very compelling information to me. Now let's listen a little bit about uh, what Ron has to say here in Zedekiah's cave, which, uh, take it away, Ron. God arranges everything if we ask him. And he gives us the proper motives if we ask him. In other words, we human beings have tendencies that are not good. Basically, they, uh, our ancestors all the way down, you know, we have inherited some uh, tendencies for evil. The Bible says the natural heart is enmity with God. And so I think all of us know that. Uh, but anyway, God promises that he will write his laws upon the fleshy tables of our heart. He'll give us his Holy Spirit to help us resist things that are self-destructive, that are dishonoring God, and that will keep us from being used by God to help other people. Well, let's all pray we get a little bit more on track with that. Because I think Ron's what Ron is right that <clears throat> we all have tendencies towards uh, ungodliness, and so we can use all the help we can get. All right, here's a little bit more from John Calvin, his background in Switzerland. The part of Switzerland which is of interest to us was called French Switzerland because it bordered on France, and the French language was spoken there. It was composed of the cantons of Geneva, Vaud, and Neuchâtel. Neuchâtel. I don't know how to say that. And the canton of Geneva was the city by the same name on the shore of the lake also called Geneva. The government of Geneva requires a brief explanation because it was to play a major role in the Reformation there. The citizens of the city met annually in the General Assembly to choose four syndics and a treasurer. The citizens were in turn ruled by a little council of 25, which included the current syndics and those of the previous years. The council of 60, appointed by the little council, decided matters of larger policy. In 1527, a council of 200 was added, which included the little council and 175 others chosen by the little council. It was especially this latter body which gave Calvin many of his problems. The Reformation had come to Germany not only had but had spread to other parts of Europe. In Switzerland, Swingli had done the majority of the work. I've never heard of Swingli. Might have to look him up. And in Geneva, the way for Calvin had pre been prepared by the fiery and radical reformer William Farrell. Bern, to the north of Neuchâtel, had joined the Reformation in 1528 and sent ministers into French Switzerland to preach the gospel there. Farrell was the leader and a more powerful figure could scarcely be found. Farrell's entire work was carried on with struggle and in turmoil and in 1532 Farrell was driven from the city. In 1534 he returned and through disputations and preaching won a bit of breathing room from, for the Protestants, who were converted under his preaching. But in his favor was the fact that, because Geneva was so small, it was technically under the rule of Basil, and Basil supported the Reformation. 
Gradually, the priests, monks, and nuns began to leave the city, and the Reformation was officially established in 1535 and 1536. But the city remained the heir of Roman Catholicism, a place of frightening moral conditions. Okay, we'll pick up more of that the next time. And uh, thanks for joining us. We'll do another one in just a little bit. Bye.